Uh, this is from Chaos to Craftsmanship, Design Patterns to Elevate Your Local Drupal Development Environment. And today I'm going to introduce uh, some software design patterns. And this is Tried to True Solutions. So how do you get your code to a, a place that's more reusable, more maintainable, more organized? And while this session is just an introduction, I hope you leave here like curious and with enough understanding to dig in a little bit more. Maybe I can give you a little bit of direction on what that is. Who am I to say these things? My name is Jim Vomero. I'm an engineering manager at Four Kitchens, and I've been in Drupal well over 10 years, and I use this for all my nerdy hobbies, from homebrewing beer, running calculations, to planning my retro arcade projects, to teaching kids how to survive the zombie apocalypse. Drupal is at the core of all that. It's a summer camp thing, not like a... Um, if you have any questions after this, after this presentation, reach out either here at the conference, let's hang out, or I'm always excited to talk shop or keep this conversation going. So why this topic? Um, because someone's already solved your problems, and that's just the case in general. As developers, we have a tendency to save the same, solve the same problem over and over again. So why reinvent the wheel? Um, there are some benefits now to using these design patterns. I mentioned promoting reusability is really just about adopting tried and true solutions. Making our code more maintainable by organizing it in a very structured and predictable way, something that the community understands. Facilitating scalability, it, that's really about um, allowing other developers to add features without risk to breaking the existing code. And just these design patterns embody best practices and design principles, which is going to lead to higher quality software. So I am going to use some computer science terms today. That's not my background. But as teaching these things, I start to get over my own imposter syndrome by using the words. So if you're algorithm, instance, instantiation, polymorphism, don't, don't get afraid. This is not an academic exercise. These are actual practical examples, things that you could start doing in your projects as soon as this session's over. Um, I also enjoy taking inspiration from other industries on this one because you know, I'm leveling up in my career, and I'm trying to talk the talk, trying to use those insider industry terms, and I, I kind of want to draw inspiration from a short order chef saying, I had to write this down, give me a walk in the park, a cow over the fence, and a stack of Johnny Cakes all with a twist. Or maybe a football coach saying, set up a cover two inverted zone with a man under. Someone's got to tell me if that's a real thing. I'm probably more of the chess fan, so maybe I would hear an announcer saying, uh, facing the English opening, uh, we've laid the framework for a hedgehog system. I actually don't know what that is either. Uh, music. Okay, there's one I can relate to. Uh, give me a 12-bar blues riff and B with a call and response. These are words that you don't need to know to be a good musician. You could be a heck of a musician, have no idea what I just said. But if you're in on that lingo, you can communicate with other people that are at that part of your, your institution, your skill, whatever you're trying to practice. Um, and that's, that's true here even in these design patterns. In the software industry, we have the same purpose. And so someone may look at your code and say, oh, geez, this module uses a series of plugins man managed by an abstract factory. And I see the resources are loaded with dependency injection. So it's that shared language that will hopefully empower your team, make it easier for people to contribute, to get on board. And there are, this is just a few, um, there's usually three categories of design patterns, creational, structural, and behavioral. But there are hundreds of patterns that fall in here. And you might know of some of these, the singleton, the factory, dependency injection, using these in Drupal already. Maybe you've seen them, but been too timid to write your own. Uh, structural ones, adapter, decorator, plugins. Behavioral patterns, like switching out caching strategies or observers. Um, they're great to get to know, but you only need a few to get started. So I'm going to use some time today to introduce a couple, go over some basics, and maybe just give some warnings about why you don't want to drift away from the basics. Like, these fundamentals do matter. I feel like a lot of us learn a little bit, and then we just stop learning, because it's like, oh, that's extra. I'm not writing banking software in some low-level language. Why do I need to know that? Uh, I, th I think you're doing yourself and your team and the Drupal community injustice if you don't at least get acclimated to this language. So let's see what we can get. Um, who here's comfortable with object-oriented programming? It doesn't have to be in PHP. Okay, more than half the room. Awesome. I'm going to go over the basics, but I'm not actually teaching it. I just want to use the words so that when we use them in a very um, focused way, where we start combining these things, we can fall back on the definitions we're setting up front. So object-oriented programming, that's been around for more than 50 years, and companies have you know, created structures around object-oriented principles. It's how the teams often contribute contribute and collaborate around how data models are set up. 
And there's four pillars, the, the abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Yeah, I had to write that down. The main purpose of abstraction is just hiding the unnecessary bits. So I have an example here of an automobile class. And publicly, we want to be able to turn the car on, push the gas, push the brakes, turn the wheel. But there's also private parts. The user is not going to control when the spark plug fires. That's something that's internal to the class. So that's our abstraction. I said there's four. Let's go through all of them. Encapsulation. This is how we bind those objects together. So I have a video game fighter class as my example. And I can see that there are some, in this case, private statistics like health and stamina. There's some public ways maybe you can work on those. Or in my example on the screen, kick, punch, jump, run. Those are all public functions. And this ability to encapsulate has a side effect. I'm not sure if it's good or bad. But it starts to take objects and model them after our real world. This is how we often think about objects. It doesn't have to, but it's, it's what we do. We give them some life. Inheritance. This is probably the big one. When we start working in, in object-oriented programming, this is kind of where we get stuck. We think, objects, cool, and objects can have children. You might have went through some lesson. I have an uh, animal, and the animal has a dog class. And you, you, know, you went through all these things. It's usually inheritance, so I didn't want to do an animal. I got some noodles up on the screen. Pasta is one of my parent classes, but it has two children. It's extended by long pasta and filled pasta. Both are delicious. Try them all. But even those are extended, right? There's a whole family tree of pastas. So fettuccine and spaghetti extend long pasta. This is hierarchical inheritance. And it's what we often think about in object-oriented programming. But this is just one of the four pillars. Let's keep that in mind as we start going through, because this is where we fail a lot. I also have an example of multiple inheritances. So, uh, and which one is this? This is a Silverado EV, extends automobile and implements two different interfaces, truck and electric powered. So inheritance is important. And finally, polymorphism, uh, I, I just, it's, it's creating a consistent interface so that we can access the same types of information or use the same methods across a series of components. So no matter what your pet is, a dog, snake, or a cat, it can greet you with a nice, delightful <laughs> woof, hiss, or judgmental stare. I might be projecting. Uh, last thing on basics, uh, I was going to do a coding example, but I'm always way too afraid. So I have some screenshots. My apologies. If they're hard to read, I'll make sure my slides are available. Uh, I'll just do my best job to describe them. I have a duck class. You've seen this, right? Create a new duck. Uh, so an object is an instantiation of a class. Donald equals new duck. Donald can now display. And I can create a second one. Daisy. Daisy is an inst instantiation of a duck. Daisy is a class. I have two separate classes. They take up unique spaces in memory, but they came from that same cookie cutter. What's, uh, what's I think the premise here is I'm going to make a duck app, something my company's going to be very proud of. And uh, I want to add more ducks. Let's do that. All right, bring out the abstraction. We now have an abstract duck, and I know a duck can display. Every one of my ducks in my duck app has something that's going to pop up on the screen. Every duck can quack. Every duck can swim. Every duck can fly. And by putting those common things in the parent class, the abstract class, I now made them in there once, right? Single utility place, let's just say it once. I'm not going to repeat myself. But in my child classes, each one has a unique display method. It's enforced by this abstract class. My apologies if any of these object-oriented words are going too fast. It's kind of a prereq for where I'm going. So I don't know, save this, watch this session a couple times. <laughs> Uh, and just as a, a reminder, so I have two, two child, da Donald is now an instantiation of Mallard, Daffy is now an instantiation of the Redhead Duck, uh, and they both can swim and fly, but you can't instantiate duck directly because I'm using abstracts. At least that's the case in PHP. Other languages have slightly different rules around this uh, when you get into interface design. And as I said, this is where we start to fail. I've taken my cool new duck app to a conference, and I want to demo it to the latest and greatest techpreneurs. Is that a word? I don't know. It is now. Uh, and I have my mallard duck and my redhead duck. And now I have a rubber duck that's quacking. And that's insane. Rubber ducks don't quack. Rubber ducks squeak. And I have a wooden duck, and it's flying. And that's just not true. So my app is breaking in front of me because I realized that the CEO of Duck Enterprises had a second team adding ducks to my app. And they didn't know about the, the, the classes and my expectations. You know, there wasn't maybe even with the best of interfaces, Something got a little messed up over time. And there's a lot of ways we could refactor this. I'm sure in this room we've probably come up with a dozen different ways, but often this is what happens. Our first response is, okay, let's look at what's different. I'm going to take that rubber duck and I'm going to say, it does not quack, a rubber duck squeaks, and I'm going to override that child method. So now rubber duck quack method returns a squeak. 
And my decoy duck, that's a wooden duck. It should never quack. It should never fly. But I guess they could swim. They could throw it in the water. Um, so I'm going to override those methods too. This works. It's not sustainable. And there's no guarantee that the way I organize this is the way you would have. One of the problems we have here now is we've created this responsibility that if you want to change this system, you really have to look at all the parents and all the children before carefully making a change. Because if you change something in a parent, it might have an inverse or, or you know, an ill effect on one of the other children in this app. Um, you've created a spot where we have like inheritance that's overridden. Well, that's not inheritance, is it? It's just a weird bookkeeping exercise. Luckily, design patterns to the rescue. So, Let's say instead of us going our own way, we said, let's adopt a design pattern. This is where I usually do a 15 minute, let's do a live coding thing. We don't have time for that today, but I'll share my repo so you can look at it. Let's see what happens with the strategy design pattern. Da, 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 da. I have an abstract duck now. I've added some new methods. It still has the display. Every duck needs a display. It has a swim. Every duck's going to be able to swim. You can throw that rubber duck in the water. Sure, that's swimming. But I've created two things that I'm calling behaviors. And we can use these words interchangeably. You can call them strategies. You could probably call them um, algorithms. So I have a fly behavior and a quack behavior. And, and every duck's going to do that. They're either going to perform a fly or perform a quack. When I look at my ducks all the way on the right side of the screen, they're fairly simple again. It's just the display. There's nothing here getting overridden. We are just deciding that each duck has it in charge of its own display. But when we instantiate them somewhere in the constructor, constructor not on this sheet, uh, we have to pick a quack behavior and pick a fly behavior. That's what the set methods are for. And so what's neat is we've created this interface, quack behavior. And we're saying, these are my valid quacks. It can quack, it can squeak, it can be mute. Maybe in the future I want to add one. It's going to honk. Uh, that's easy because the interface is in charge of how it grows. And so as long as every duck's using that interface, I can add, remove, and alter the behaviors in here without fear of having to change the ducks or change the parents. Changing a behavior is independent of the other two things. Same with flying. I've created a fly interface, and right now I have two. No fly and winged flight. Maybe I put jetpack on there at some point. I can add an extra fly behavior, and anything that has to do with that behavior is in that one file in this middle column. I don't need to worry about changing the children. I'm not going to break them. The existing code's going to work. I don't need to change the parent. That would also be dangerous. Uh, and this sort of separation of concerns is the, the, the strategy design pattern. Uh, I'm going to write that, read out the actual definition. Um, we're encapsulation, wait, it's a family of algorithms where we encapsulate change we encapsulate things that make it interchangeable. This lets the algorithm vary independently from the client that uses it. Um, I didn't know what that meant, but it did finally click in my head. For more than 10 years before I started doing this, I would have bosses and peers and, and other leaders tell me, you should really focus on composition over inheritance. I thought I knew what that meant. This is it. You're composing a duck. My duck, my mallard, I'm going to pick what features I want on it not inherit it from a parent and possibly override it. So this is composition over inheritance. I heard it for more than a decade before I finally knew what it meant. And it's like, oh, design patterns, you got my back. Um, let's get away from ducks because I think I went as far as I can with ducks. Maybe, maybe we need some pictures or some visuals. I'll give a couple of uh, real world examples. If you're on Reddit, uh, so you get lots of posts, little microblogging type style, there's different sort algorithms. So for Reddit, you can sort by new, top, hot, or controversial. Each one of those is going to sort a list of, I don't know how many posts, depends on how many is in the community and what, how they window it. Um, but it's a different strategy, behavior, algorithm uh, for the same function. So if someone clicks a button, and if Reddit wants to add another one, a random, they can add that search, add the new button, and they don't need to refactor the other algorithms. Each one of these is encapsulated as its own strategy. Another example is payment handlers. They come and go. New service spins up. I don't want to have to refactor my Visa and Discover card and all these other payments just to add another one in some convoluted long class. I'm going to make each one of those a standalone interface, and you program against the interface, and you grow the interface rather than having to change the instantiations of each one. We just know that each one of those is going to have a place where you validate the credit card, you prove that the payment worked, or you handled error states. Um, and the last one I'm going to do is, is Google Maps. I, I do this all the time, right? I'm, I want to go somewhere. I say from here to my hotel, and then I have to pick a strategy or an algorithm. Am I going to walk, take a car, public transit? And it's going to change the calculation. If I'm taking, 
If I'm walking, it's going to allow paths that a car couldn't go. It's going to actually do a complete new recalculation of the map. And so being able to drop that in as a separate strategy is the heart and soul of this sort of strategy design pattern. Um, I, I know this was a lot. I'm just trying to pique interest. But I will pause. Uh, is there any questions, like right now, just burning questions on strategy design pattern on the surface? Yes? How do you know when inheritance is OK? It's always OK. So here's the, uh, here's, here's the, the, the trick to all of this. Um, uh, a lot of it has to do with scalability and how you want to manage the app application. Um, what I have found is that at companies where you might have multiple teams working either at different times, once a year, a different team comes in and works on an app, or teams that are working even at the same time and contributing the same thing, it makes sense to, function, to, to focus more on co compostability. The problem is it's a lot more boilerplate. I mean, you saw how many boxes I had on that screen. So um, if, if you're a small team, I, I don't think anyone should feel shamed for putting things in an overloaded base class. Uh, I, I would just start to get that sinking feeling in your stomach that if you find that you're constantly overriding things in a child class, you're creating too much mystery and it's just going to be error prone. So I don't think there's any hard and fast rules. And I think that's something we don't appreciate enough from object-oriented programming. It's a paradigm. It's a set of tools. It is not a strategy in and of itself. Great question. All right, I'm going to keep going. I want to show off at least one more. Oh, wait, Drupal. Let's talk Drupal, because I said that I would do that in today's session. You can find these pretty regularly. Uh, at the end of the session, if we have time, maybe I can look up a few of them. But Twig Cache Strategies, that's, that's one you can easily find by just searching the word behavior, I think. There is a file system cache behavior where you're going to have the Twig render, is it, cached? I don't remember. I don't work in the front end. Uh, or a null cache. And so you're switching between two strategies. If you wanted to come up with another database-driven one, for whatever reason you want to store it in Redis, you can come up with a Redis cache store, and you don't have to worry about refactoring the other two. <clears throat> Drupal search, so being able to switch between Solar, Elasticsearch, database. These are another sort of implementation. It's very inspired by a, a behavior, the way it's encapsulated. And similarly with file handling. So being able to save you know, sort of the native Drupal, I want my files to save to my files directory, or I want them to save to an AWS bucket, or I would like them to save through some sort of a proxy. I don't even know where the files are. There's some sort of a, a API that's going to deal with that for me. Maybe they're going through Cloudinary or something like that. Um, so these are great examples if you want to see how this sort of variance and encapsulation work on a, in a strategy. I want to show off one more. Um, I have a bunch of favorites, though. If I have time, I'll show off two more. Uh, but I have slides ready for one more, and that is a factory. And you may have seen this one, too. I like to pick on this one, not because it's a good one to start with. In fact, if you want to start, start with the singleton. Get to know that one and then never use it. I'll tell you why later. Um, but it's a really great learning experience. But factory, you're going to see throughout Drupal's code base, if you just search the files for the word factory, you're going to see a ton of them. And uh, I'm going to start by showing off this simple factory. The, one of the real goals of creational patterns is to not use that word new. New's not, once again, like object oriented. New's not bad. We say new object. Um, but it is often a missed opportunity. We can't always control what happens after you instantiate it. You can't always change it from other parts of the PHP lifecycle. So we use things like the service container, independency injection, um, or in this case, a factory, so that we don't have to micromanage what objects are being created everywhere. So. Factories, they are going to encapsulate object creation. Yeah, I know that's a lot of words. Let's show an example here of a class that's just too overloaded. It's, it's creating a pizza. And I, I eventually want to create a, a series. I want to create a restaurant chain that can make these pizzas. And so I'm just out of the box, my pizza class is going to have methods to prepare, bake, cut, and box that pizza. And I'm going to need to describe the properties of that pizza. So set of cheese, set of crust, set of toppings. Maybe override. And just like it's meat, lo meat lovers equals true, and then you ignore the other toppings. I'm not sure what my business logic would be there. Or I, I come up with a special limited time barbecue pizza just for one market. And, and now I need a, a flag for that one as well. So uh, I have a number of methods, though. And that's why it's dot, dot, dot. There's who knows how many methods in this pizza class. It's a lot. And I want to take this, and I want to apply it to multiple markets. My software is going to work for all my franchisees. There's a lot of ways I can break this down. And in fact, as we start just even going what's called a simple factory, it, it kind of feels like what we did before with a lot of inheritance, where I created a pizza interface, a pizza factory interface, and that's in charge of the basics. 
Uh, every, no matter what location, when you make a pizza, we're gonna prepare it, bake it, cut it, box it. But I find that my office in New York, the restaurant there, they're gonna have different cheeses, sauces, doughs, and different specialty items on the menu, as opposed to my one in Chicago. And this is a valid factory. So what I've done is I've created a class, this is the right column, I've created a class for every pizza we offer, a cheese pizza, a veggie pizza, a pepperoni pizza, a barbecue pizza, meat lover's pizza, margarita, hot chicken, and <coughs> oops, all pineapple, everyone's favorite. This is valid as far as being a factory class. And what we would have in practice is uh, instead of uh, my, my mobile app, my digital assistant ordering the pizza by calling the pizza directly, like ordering a pepperoni pizza, the, the, the client interacts with the pizza factory, and the pizza factory knows which one to pick. So if I put the parameters in for a cheese pizza, it goes, great, I know it's a cheese pizza. I instantiate the right class. I never say get a new cheese pizza. I tell the factory, the factory does gets the new object. That sounds very basic, but it actually works out really great, especially when you get into automated testing and such. So I don't, order, I don't create these classes on the right. The factory creates it. But this is also pretty trivial. Um, I, I think a lot of people might call this more of a... Um, uh, an idiom than an actual pattern, you know, being able to say, okay, we have a factory and the factory gets the pizza. Um, but you will see this quite a bit. And, and I think the example here that you often see, uh, for whatever reason, object-oriented programming loves animals. So, you, you know, you have your animal parent class and then you're on a farm, so you have a cow, a sheep, chicken. Instead of creating a new animal for my farm simulator and saying new chicken, I will say, animal factory and pass in the string a chicken and it knows which class to get to and it just has an if else if else if, if else if statement and then returns I don't know an error message if that animal doesn't match uh, it's not that interesting I didn't put it on the screen for a reason let's show let's show what this could be once again as soon as we start going down this rabbit hole of design patterns there's a lot more boxes and and that's good I don't I want you to embrace it don't be afraid of all this boilerplate code because if you've done it for a while and you've gotten used to, say, creating controllers in Drupal you know, 8 and up, um, I don't think I can go back to, or, or actually let's do a, um, an event subscriber and being able to control things very fine-tuned. Even though there's all this extra boilerplate, I, I can't go back to doing everything in a hook. You can't make me. Like, I, I, I don't mind the boilerplate. I, don't, I need to copy it or generate it or have chat GPT write it. But I don't mind all that boilerplate if it gives me something that I can share with another developer and that developer with confidence knows exactly what they're looking at. And they go, yep, that's a controller. I know exactly where the logic is. Or that's a block, there's gonna be a render method. Uh, it's sure it looks different from what we might have been used to if, if you came from a different space. So in this example, uh, this is more uh, traditional, what's called a factory method, which is a pattern. Uh, we've created interfaces for each collection of ingredient. And so I still have a pizza factory interface that hasn't changed. And I still have locations uh, in Chicago and New York. But in this case, um, they're not calling the pizzas directly. They're going to build the pizzas. That's the factory part of it. So for every one of these, they are going to create, they're going to pick a dough, pick a sauce, pick a cheese, pick some toppings. And there's an interface for each one of those. So my dough interface can be a pan pizza, deep dish pizza, or a thin crust. I can add or remove as needed, and they don't have to apply to all of these. Maybe deep dish doesn't apply to New York. Similarly with sauces, maybe not all sauces are available in all area by appetite, by promotion, and, and cheeses. When I want to think about this on a menu, here's two of my franchisees' menus. I have Chicago's pizza menu versus New York's pizza menu. They still, this is the most important part, they both have a cheese pizza. And I want to be able to order that from a factory using my factory method and just say order cheese pizza. I don't want to have to say every time, order pizza, sauces, plum, you know, maybe, maybe it's a switch statement. It's like, if, if Chicago, order pizza, sauces, plum, uh, cheese is mozzarella, and Parmesan topping is oregano. Uh, I want all of that to be done. I want that built into the factory itself. So the factory controls what it means to be a cheese pizza, and I just order with the words cheese. I don't, I don't try to assemble the pizza every time, and I also don't do that thing that I had a few slides ago and have every possible permutation as a, of a pizza as a class. That would just be overwhelming. This is a lot. It's all I can do with our sense of time. So once again, I'm hoping I'm intriguing you, opening you up to something new. Um, 
I do want to leave a couple of thoughts on like where you can start to see factories because they are all over the Drupal Symphony code base. They're in Guzzle and a bunch of tools that you might use already. Uh, Entity Query Factory is one of the places you'll see them first. So Drupal uses um, uh, uses these these factories to uh, 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 what's the word? Just abstract where we're storing things. You, when even something as simple as Drupal Search, it doesn't have to be native nodes. It can be using a REST endpoint. It could be flat CSV files. So being able to have different places to swap out. This isn't strategies. This is, this is more functional. So we're, we're building a connector, or we're building a processor, or building a renderer. Uh, similarly with form factories. So there's lots of different types of forms. I want to see a form in a block. I want to see a form in an AJAX modal. I want to see a form on, on the bottom of a page in a, in a template area. So forms use factories quite a bit. And the number one case you'll see these are plugins. If you've ever created a custom plugin, you've probably created some sort of a management class for that plugin. And so you have your new plugin factory. And uh, blocks is a good example. There's a block plugin factory, and all your blocks are discoverable through it. OK, I'm going to get really semantic here now. The blocks themselves are a different, the plugin is a different kind of design pattern. But the factory managing it's a factory. Uh, so you will find these all through the code base. And if we have time at the end, I'll just search the code base and we'll look and go, wow, look at all those factories, so neat. Um, I, I encourage you to create your own plugin. There is a ton, there are a ton of conference talks at other Drupal camps on how you can create your own custom plugins. And you will end up creating a factory at some point in that. And that will be a great way to drill this lesson home. That might be the most useful pattern you use as far as day-to-day -day Drupal work and being able to extend what's already at Drupal core, either using existing plugins or starting to create your own, which I do regularly. And a few more honorable mentions. Singleton. This is the first one I learned. It's probably the first one you should learn, but it's also considered a bit of an anti-pattern. So for a singleton, you want to just create something once, but you never are allowed to use the new word. You actually can't create a new instance of this. Uh, you just say, give me that object, and the, the object manages itself. This is useful in two ways. It's useful if you want to limit the amount of memory you instantiate. A database connection is a great example. If I'm building a student dashboard and I have an advisor block at the top, and that needs to find out the student's information, connect to the database, get the information. I have course information at the bottom. That block is going to reach out to the database, get some information, come back. On the right-hand sidebar, I have information about paying your bill. It's going to connect to the database, get the information, come back. Every one of those connections to the database could be a new keyword, like an object or program, new connection. But uh, that's just not efficient. So often in singletons, one of the first examples you'll learn is how to create a persistent database connection that you can use over the entire life cycle of the PHP request. You're also going to see that uh, it's useful for sharing information across that life cycle. So if I am working on a shopping cart and I want to keep information up in the upper right hand corner, but I also want to be able to change it in the bottom left hand corner, adding and removing items, and maybe there's some quick picks in the toolbar, I could just keep a bunch of temporary information in a temp store or I can use a singleton. So singleton lets you share information between parts of your website. You'll probably never use this in Drupal, but Drupal does have the service container. I create services for all my custom code. If I'm writing a hook, I'm probably putting it in a service. The hook just calls the service. I fight my teammates on that all the time. They say that's unnecessary. I like unit testing. That's one, one of my wins. But I also like it because it's very memory efficient, and I don't have to worry about where work is being loaded. I put things in there. So the service container, if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, works very much like a singleton. You can share information. You can minimize your, your footprint as far as what all you're spinning up memory-wise. Plugins is the one I mentioned before. Take a peek, whether it's image styles, blocks, widgets, fields. There's a lot of examples of plugins, and that is a great creational pattern. Creation? I'm not sure which pattern that is. Um, structural pattern, I think. And the observer pattern is another one you'll use quite a bit uh, if you start digging into Drupal's code. So form validation is one of my favorite examples. You tell a field to validate itself, or you tell the form to validate a collection of fields, but you're not checking that on every possible interaction. Uh, there is this observer that is watching and waiting for actions to happen and reacting to it. So this is a, a pretty interesting pattern. Um, all of these, though, are, are interesting, and you just have to find the right time to use them. That's the hardest thing getting started here, is feeling confident that you're not spinning your wheels and writing a bunch of code just to confuse your teammates. <laughs> Been there, done that. So my encouragement to you, 
is to stay curious. Uh, the two examples that I gave today, the pizza and the duck app, came directly from this book, Head First Design Patterns. I, I led a bit of a book club at Four Kitchens. We, we meet once a month to do like practice groups. And <clears throat> one of the sessions we did was on each of the design patterns. We built it from the ground up. I'll include a link to my repo of those examples if you're interested. But this is the book that I, I used. It is not for everybody. It teaches by being silly. It teaches through weird examples. It teaches through repetition. We'll say the same thing three, four, five times sometimes. If that annoys you, just walk away from this book. In fact, the authoritative, the authoritative book on the subject is the next one, Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software. It's also known as the Gang of Four. There's the four authors on there. This is the book. It's very dry. It is, it is very much an encyclopedia-type read, but um, I, I would put it on your shelf. And if, if that's how you want to learn, if you want to just kind of crunch down on documentation until you get it, that is also good. Then there's several good websites, but refactoring.guru has kind of in the middle some good information, but also some good illustrations. What's great but also unsatisfying about all these tools is they're not quick to show you code. And that could really bum you out if you're like me and want to get your hands dirty. But learning these patterns isn't about the code itself. To go back to my restaurant analogy, it's like that quick service chef saying, give me a, and then listing off all these weird recipe analogies. We're not looking for what cook does it on what cooking service, which pot they use, how long, what temperature, like the cook's in charge of that. The design pattern was just the language that we use to describe the type of work that needs to get done. It's just unsatisfying for me when I look in a book and I just I want to see the code. And in fact, in this book in particular, it is Java code, so I'll give you that warning, but it's the same lesson, so you'll be fine. And if it really bothers you, people put their PHP examples online for you to consume. Uh, let's take a, oh, did I have one more? I thought I had one more page. I do, I do not. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions, and I also have code I can show. But uh, on this slide is a link to my design pattern examples that I've done in our practice group. Uh, so what kind of questions do you have in design patterns? Have you used them? Did I scare you away? Did I pique your interest? Do you want to hear stories about where I've actually used these? Yes. <laughs> the last one? All of those? Yes. All of them. Okay. I will, and I will make sure to share my slides. One of the most important um, places I use design patterns is when I find myself duplicating code. And, and two very recent examples was one I was doing something that was sort of a custom form builder. It looked almost like web forms, but it didn't have the GUI. I needed a bunch of fields with unique templates uh, to act as like a Drupal form builder and data was going into like a Salesforce type of situation. So I needed to create my own text input. I need to create my own checkbox input. I need to create my own radio input. All of these were using Drupal API under the hood, but they needed a wrapper around them. They needed custom validation. They needed um, a bunch of decorators. And so when I found that I was writing the same code over and over and over again, it didn't take long for me to say, this is too much. This is a plugin. And so being able to create a brand new type of plugin in Drupal was you know, wildly valuable in that I now have a controller and I say, well, every plugin has or can have a validation. Every plugin can have a template. And if it doesn't have a template, it's going to default to the native Drupal input field or whatever it is. Every plugin can have a set of CSS selectors or ARIA um, attributes that we want to make sure for accessibility. We don't want to use certain ones out of the box from our, our, our CRM. So I, I think I had 30 or 40 different fields. But each plugin was actually just a few lines of code. And the things that were common were put in the factory. So it was a field, fa field creator factory, and then it would say, okay, get me our custom checkbox, get me our custom radio button, get me our custom. And so the factory managed a series of plugins. I also did that recently with a site where we used a bunch of different types of iframes as part of Drupal Media. So they would show up in the media library. We would have uh, you know, an input from Google Sheets or one from a Qualtrics survey. And each one of these iframes had a unique set of properties. So I made those plugins. The plugins were put behind a factory. So that was a very useful case. And um, I'll say the, the, the singleton-like version I use at least once a month. I end up creating a, a service that, for one reason or another, I want some sort of a persistent connection. And this is one that actually confused me for a while. So 
let's say I am doing some analytics. This is kind of what I did not long ago. I, I wanted to track some analytics and I'm looking at page metadata as the page is being built. So the header loads and I need to record some information from the header. And then later in the footer, I need to record some information from the footer. Now, even just using Twig templates, I can, or Twig custom functions, I can send data through a service. And so it's like, okay, I got some stuff from the sidebar, stuff from the footer. All these different pages are, as it's building, giving metadata back to this service class. Um, because I'm using the service container, it's just one spot in memory that's storing all of this data. That's actually really hard to do otherwise. Normally when you work in a place like a Drupal template, when that template's done, it's, it's done. The memory's not allocated, the thing's rendered, it's gone. So having a persistent set of memory without having to like write to a database or store something in a file is a great use of a service container. And I, I use that quite a bit. Um, the other reason I like it is because it just forces you to organize code and you can do things like create unit tests and such where you can't do that if you have just 30 alter hooks throughout your module. So those are a couple of random examples. Any other questions? I know I threw a lot at you, and that's the hardest part. Please. Tell me how you run your book club, and how do you get people to actually read the book? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we still ex experiment with the format, and it's about to change a little bit more, because what happens is we have different interest groups at Four Kitchens. We call them practice groups, and there's a front-end one and a Drupal one. I co-run the one called the Computer Science Practice Group. And ultimately, there are some over-ambitious people that want to do them all. So we're trying to run them more like birds of a feather at a conference and give people the ability to do a bunch and spread them out. Uh, we're still tinkering with that format. But what has worked really well for us, especially for me uh, as a manager, I'm looking for people that I can tap on the shoulder and, and, and get them interested. And so when we did the design pattern one, I actually went to one of our associate developers and said, I'd really like you to present the singleton one. I will do it with you. <laughs> and so being able to put somebody in charge that maybe uh, didn't feel confident was huge. And as a result, I think attendance went up because they were like, oh, we have to support this person. They're new and they put all this thought into it and we have to make them feel like they're achieving. So uh, I would say most of the people that came for, for reading the design patterns book, they, they were mostly there to support one of our employees. And so the peer pressure angle works. <laughs> and then the other thing was um, we announced it and made it as approachable as we could early on. So we made sure that uh, every one of our sessions, in this case going through this book, had some sort of exercise. We published it at least two or three weeks ahead of time so that if people wanted to work ahead, they could. We used to do a series on algorithms too where you just find like one of these code katas and you have folks try to complete it. So what's the fastest way to sort this? Or you know, here's a connect four board, write a function to validate if somebody won and we challenge our team to do it. We have to give them lots of time because it's just, it's impractical to think folks on a week by week basis can participate. So it's been a bit of a chore relying a lot on peer pressure, but um, you know, if three or four people come out of the 20 I invite, I'm actually quite happy with it because for the computer science practice group especially, I am going for the types of folks that are looking for a new challenge. And maybe they're not feeling fulfilled at their regular Drupal work or they're not being stretched in new areas. And this, especially, I think most of my coworkers probably don't have a computer science degree. They just found their way into this and they keep leveling up and it's easy to kind of get complacent. So this, this, at least for a few people, for a, a subset of people gets them very excited about programming again. Thank you. Sure thing. I'll show off if, if, if the internets will let me. Ah, yeah, there it is. Um, I'll show off just an example of searching for the word facul uh, factory in a Drupal code base, you're gonna find things pretty quick. So you can see an example here, here's a curl factory. So if you've done this before, it's easy to write out a curl request, but how do you write a handler to do all of the different types of, of parameters you could put on there? And is it get, post, what kinds of responses are we gonna get when it comes back? That's a good use of a factory. There's a number of very specific settings for different types of requests and we want something to build all of those rather than creating specific handlers for each one. Let's go down the list, see if we find a couple more. I'm glad we have time for this. Uh, you see it a lot in caching, in, in this case, uh, the query, but there's a Q one as well. HTTP is requests. Oh, parsers, yes. 
you're gonna see you're gonna see so many different design patterns around how do you figure out what's inside the DOM, and I don't think anyone can do it right. That is just an impossible task. But you can see examples of what's going on in the Drupal community, <coughs> key value stores, oh generators. I, w I do want to quick look at one of the plugin factories if we can. Um, actually, it was probably on top there. Plugin form, that's a pretty good one. I think that's a peek. Uh, so a few things, as you're starting to use these in Drupal to keep in mind, um, we are getting better and better as a community and using interfaces. If you're not accustomed to that, it is going to help with your IDE experience. And it's also going to help us start to share our lessons learned with other parts of Drupal. And you saw this when the node module kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, it had a lot of opinionated code. And we started to see those pieces come out as their own interfaces. So being revisionable, being translatable, having all the editorial workflows, um, all those started coming out as their own interfaces. So embrace that. I think we still have a lot of great lessons we can learn from it, but I love that we do that. Another paradigm you're going to see regularly is the word base. So if you're unfamiliar with that, uh, let's just sign base. No, oh, no. Let's see if it will. Here we go. Field formatter base. If a class ends in the word base, that means it's abstract. And so you'll often see these next to each other. We see base field formatter base. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, and that's going to be implemented. Let's just find it's probably right next to it. There it is, base field formatter. So being able to have these in the same directory is very much something Drupal's been going for. We don't usually use the word abstract. We'll just put the word base on. And then the concrete class will have a shorter name for it. Um, well, similarly, we usually use the word factory. Having these naming conventions isn't necessary, but it makes it very easy to look around the Drupal code base and get a sense of where everything is. I'll show you one more thing before we leave. If I can. Oh, no, I can't. Can I? We can try. I don't have internet access from this room, but let me see if I can get access to that duck demo. And if I can't, that's okay. Open recent. Awesome. So this is my repo that I, I linked to on one of the last slides. Open this up a little bit more. And we want to see from my strategy design pattern, what does it look like in PHP to have, I, I give a start and a final for each one of these, but what does it look like to in implement those fly behaviors and quack behaviors? Uh, they just end up becoming properties. So every duck, it's abstract, has to have a fly behavior, has to have a quack behavior, and when we create a new one, we are going to, well, I'll show where one is being created at the bottom. We're going to add it to the, the constructor. So my redhead duck is going to have the quack behavior of quack, the fly behavior of fly. Similarly, the rubber duck is going to have the quack behavior of squeak and the fly behavior of no fly. So this is, this is the pattern. It's, it was a lot of boxes when we looked at it on the slide, but actually it's pretty predictable and easy to understand when we look at it in the code. So take a chance and, and look at this, and I don't know. I really hope you guys like it. Um, thank you all so much for letting me be part of this conference, and let's talk some more.